Guilty of murder, two Russians and a Ukrainian are convicted for their role in the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 over eastern Ukraine in 2014. Has justice been served and could the case set a precedent for legal action over Russia's invasion of Ukraine? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. It's been eight years since 298 people died when Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 was shot down over eastern Ukraine. A court in the Netherlands has now convicted three men of murder in absentia. It sentenced two Russian intelligence officers and a Ukrainian separatist leader to life in prison and ordered them to pay $16 million in compensation. Judges found the missile that shot down the jet was Russian-made came from Russia and was launched by Russian-controlled rebels. But none of the men appeared in court, and it's unclear whether they'll ever serve their sentences. A fourth Russian was acquitted because of a lack of evidence. The Dutch government has summoned the Russian ambassador in the Netherlands after Moscow said the verdict, quote, neglected impartiality. Al Jazeera's Stepvarsen reports from outside the court in Schiphol. Yeah, very good. Very good to see you. How are yeah, you? Yeah, good to see you. They travelled from all over the world to find answers eight years after the lives of their loved ones ended abruptly in the sky over Ukraine. More than 10 different nationalities were on board Malaysian Airlines flight MH17. 196 of the 298 victims were Dutch. The plane departed from Schiphol to Kuala Lumpur when it was downed over a war zone in eastern Ukraine. The bodies of those on board and debris from the plane fell in a field near the village of Krabove. The court ruled that there was no doubt that the plane was shot down with an anti-aircraft book missile brought in from Russia and fired from a field controlled by pro-Russian separatists. Two former Russian intelligence officers and one Ukrainian separatist commander are held responsible for transporting the missile. And the Rechtbank qualified. The court considered proven that the suspects conspired to purposefully and illegally bring down a plane knowing to cause mortal danger. Anton Kotte lost his eldest son, daughter-in-law and six-year-old grandson Remko, traveling to Bali for vacation. Remko's backpack was all that came home intact. For us it's very important to show the world, to show the the. Russians, see what you have done. You've, you've taken the life of a six-year-old child. And now we are eight years further on, and always I ask myself, what have they missed all these eight years? In the past two and a half years, Kotte attended more than 65 court hearings, fulfilling a promise he made to his dead son to find the truth. The judge stressed how immense the suffering of the relatives here has been for the past eight years, with the bodies of their loved ones scattered in a field in eastern Ukraine, some for weeks. But even though those convicted have not attended the trial, they feel that justice has been done. There was water in my eyes. Water in my eyes. And, well, it's, it's unbelievable. Law experts say the verdict was groundbreaking because for the first time a court ruled that Russia controlled, armed and financed the separatist rebels of the Donetsk People's Republic in eastern Ukraine. Russia has always denied any involvement. The Russian foreign ministry has called the verdict scandalous, saying that throughout the trial the court was under unprecedented pressure to impose a politically motivated outcome. Prosecutors and the three convicted men have two weeks to decide to appeal the verdict. Stepfasen, Al Jazeera, Schiphol. Let's now bring in our guests for today's Inside Story in Hilversum in the Netherlands. Thomas Shansman. Thomas lost his son Quinn in the MH17 attack. In Amsterdam, Marieke de Hoon, Assistant Professor of International Criminal Law at the University of Amsterdam. And in Oxford, Samuel Romani, an Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for joining us on Inside Story. Thomas, let me start with you, if I can. Your son, Quinn, died in the MH17 disaster. I know this has been a very difficult time for your family. Tell us first about how you felt when that verdict was 
read out in court. Do you feel justice has been done? Does this bring you any closure? I have difficulties in talking about end closure. Uh, this will never be closed. But the truth is that yesterday was uh, important to all of us, was important to me to finally hear a judge, an independent judge, well-respected internationally, that would say what happened, who is responsible, and who should be uh, convicted. So yes, it was a great day to finally hear what we know already in the past years since we have received that information through different uh, press channels already. You, you followed the, the trial, Thomas, from the very beginning. What was it like for you, for your family and the, the other victims' families who were there with you? I did uh, go twice to, uh, to the court. Uh, I lived in New York for five years, so I was not able to attend all the times. But when I was in the Netherlands, I, uh, I did attend. Or I tried to attend the, 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 the hearings uh, uh, on a live stream. Uh, the most difficult part was when uh, other next of kin were allowed to uh, tell their stories uh, in front of the, of the court and to tell what happened to them, how they uh, uh, were spending their lives in, in, in pain, uh, uh, losing jobs. Uh, it, it was, that was really painful. People that you have come to know for the past eight years since, she, since you met them in different uh, settings, uh, presentations. So they become your, your, your family, your, your friends, mm -hmm. friends that you never wanted to have, by the way. Uh, but we know them, therefore it was a great gathering yesterday as well. But these past two years were difficult. It was difficult to hear the defense uh, putting lines up again. It was difficult to read all the time those lines from the uh, Russian government. And this decision yesterday uh, hopefully will bring to an end all these lines that were up in the air all the time. That was the most painful for me. Marika de Horn, in uh, Amsterdam, you also followed this uh, trial from the very beginning, this case, and you were in court when the verdict was read. What was your initial reaction, and do you feel that justice has been served? Well, it's, it, it was a very long, complex case, and also leading to a complex uh, outcome. Uh, I think they made a really great judgment. Um, and um, on a question of whether justice is done, justice is so complex. Mm. So if you think of justice only in terms of some sort of a perfect justice, when there's only justice, if the suspects or now perpetrators are in prison, uh, then there won't be justice. But what I think the next of kin also show us so very well is that justice is so much more complex. There's so many more dimensions. And there is truth telling, there's accountability, not only, by the way, for the next of kin, but also for Ukraine, that from 2014 has been saying to the world that Russia was involved in the Donbass. And this court also acknowledged that. And hopefully, and that's also a form of justice, this uh, court ruling can also contribute to future generations in trying to settle on a, a common historical and accurate historical account of, of what actually happened back then in 2014. Yeah. Uh, Samuel Romani in Oxford, your, your reaction, more than 10 different nationalities were on board MH17. Was this verdict a balanced one? And what do you think it achieves? Well, I think the verdict was almost certainly a balanced one. If you actually look at the uh, details of this case, it's important to keep in mind that Dubinsky, one of the suspects, and Karchenko, the other suspect, uh, actually communicated with each other on the day of the attack, saying that uh, a missile had struck um, a Ukrainian uh, jet, and this was kind of a or a foreign jet that was coming forward, and this was a, a military success. And then the Russians backtracked it with a fire hose, a fire hose of falsehoods, like they typically do. They accused the Ukrainians of even trying to assassinate Vladimir Putin. They claimed it was a Ukrainian book missile and that they've been promoting disinformation and conspiracies about this for eight years. So this was a return to the truth. I think that the verdict was just. In terms of practical implications, however, it's very, very unfortunate to see that the suspects are not going to face punishment. Mm. Igor shokov Gurkin, who after years of promoting falsehoods and claiming that the corpses were perhaps uh, not fresh, 
or that the Ukrainians did it, admitted in 2020 that there was some degree of moral responsibility because he was the commander of the Donetsk forces, but he lives in Russia and is allegedly on the front lines in Ukraine with a $150,000 bounty. So unless it becomes a POW, he's not going to be punished. And the other two, it's the same thing. So it's a victory for truth, but it's very sad that the ultimate perpetrators of this are not going to be held accountable for their crimes. Thomas, what further action would you like to see taken? Because as Samuel said, it's highly unlikely that these suspects will be extradited and also highly unlikely that the Russian government will take responsibility. Uh, well, I, I believe that we'll have to wait for Putin and his government to step down uh, or being overthrown, whatever the case. But the next president of Russia will be hopefully uh, willing to uh, acknowledge their involvement and uh, make their excuses to, uh, to the families uh, in involved. So that is what I'm looking for. And this verdict at least now shows who has been uh, responsible for supplying the book missile. And these four persons that were on trial now, we know that there are many more that should be on trial, uh, higher in rank, lower in rank. Uh, I am personally not looking for one of them to, to, to be in jail. Mm. I would like to uh, see that the, the Russian government is now first stopping all their lies uh, and acknowledge their uh, responsibility. And we will wait for that. We will, I will put pressure on it and we'll ask my government and the international governments to put pressure on Russia to do that. Marike, talk to us about the evidence the court had to, to weigh. I understand that there were, was different uh, evidence from different sources. Uh, we know, of course, that Moscow has long maintained that it had no party to the conflict that unfolded in Donbass in 2014, that it not, did not control the pro-Russian uh, fighters in Donetsk. At this trial, during this trial, and with the evidence, was there clarity proven as to who was to blame and whether Russia had direct uh, responsibility? Yes, the court was extremely clear on this, and it repeated over and over how strong the evidence was of Russia's involvement and that that book came from Russia. Um, and so the court really said clearly there is no doubt um, that this has happened. And also there's absolutely completely incredible to think of a scenario that Ukraine would have been involved if only uh, for the impossibility of fabricating all that evidence then within no time. Um, and the court has gone through every element of all the evidence, and that's a lot. What um, sort of evidence that, precisely? Yeah, and so then they said that they didn't find any manipulation at all. So they did use um, um, tapped, recorded telephone conversations by the SBU, but they then, of course, had them researched, forensically analyzed for tampering with. Um, they used a lot of information from usage, like from people standing by, seeing the book come by, making pictures and videos and posting them on social media, um, open source investigators that connected all of that social media posts and other information. It was corroborated with telephone masks, so the phones that the recorded conversations were on also radiated to telephone masks. It was connected also with satellite information, weather reports, looking at, for instance, the shades uh, that you can see on the pictures and whether that was correct with the time of day and the sunshine and the type of weather it was. And, mm. and so there were so many different types of evidence, also witness statements, uh, but not, many, not very many of them, right. that the court said there is just so much evidence. It is very clear. It's absolutely impossible that any of the alternative scenarios could have happened. It was Russia, not Ukraine. Samuel, Russia dismissed, has dismissed this verdict as politically motivated. Uh, does the case make the responsibility of the Kremlin clear, in your view? I think that the case does make the responsibility of the Kremlin clear because it's undeniable that the pro-Russian separatists in Donetsk were uh, proxies and puppets of the Kremlin, right? Igor Gherkin arrived over there and fomented um, a revolution or an insurgency that the Ukrainians had to fight against after the annexation of Crimea, and it was part of a direct Russian effort to destabilize eastern Ukraine and the rest of the country more broadly. So these actors were clearly part of Russia's strategic plan, and uh, Russia gave uh, firm directions for them on, on military activities. And uh, so that's why I think that ultimately Russia is to blame uh, contextually, along with the evidence that was just mentioned.
Okay, let me come back to you, Thomas, now, because some victims' families have suggested that Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine this year may have been, may, could, could have been averted if the international community had pushed back harder um, against Moscow in the years after the MH17 disaster. Do, do you share that view? What do you think the international community could have done then? Yeah, you know, it, 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 I, I, I do share that, that feeling. Uh, it is certainly true that this whole war that we see today started eight years ago, and, and MH17 was unfortunately one of the uh, uh, biggest first uh, casualties. Uh, I, 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 I must agree that our international uh, uh, leaders uh, from the United States, from Far East and in Europe, uh, have not been able to uh, to draw the line for uh, for Putin and has accepted that he uh, uh, would go further and further and further. Uh, and even today, I must say, I am uh, 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 I I'm surprised to see what Putin is allowed to do in Ukraine, how many people he is allowed to kill. Uh, but that is that is a very very difficult political a decision on how much we want to be involved and do we want to have a third world uh, war, uh, yes or no. Right. Um, I, I must say that the United Nations in this regard uh, has not shown any strength uh, to avoid this kind of uh, uh, serious uh, problems in, in, in the world. And, and, I'm, and I'm really asking myself, what is needed? How is it possible that Russia today is... Uh, getting itself out of all kinds of international platforms to avoid uh, uh, any uh, responsibilities. This is not the kind of world order, order that we have been looking for since World War, uh, world War, uh, war II. The United Nations should set up, uh, and that's not happening. So, right. yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Samuel, did, did you think the, the West turned a blind eye in 2014? Do you think the situation that we find ourselves in today in Ukraine could have been avoided had some type of action been taken after the downing of flight MH17? Well, it was all related to each other. I mean, the downing of flight MH17 was just one of the major crimes that was committed. Well, the other was, of course, the annexation of Crimea, which was the first violation of international law and the sovereignty of a European state since the end of the Second World War. And the remainder was the entire war in Donbass, which was directly backed by Russian troops until the Minsk agreement. And then the Russian troops and advisors who assisted the DNR and LNR militias did not leave. So the MH17 has got to be viewed into the broader context of R Russian aggression against Ukraine during that time period, which was in part aimed at overthrowing and delegitimizing a democratically elected government of uh, Poroshenko that took uh, power through a popular revolution of Euromaidan. So in that context, I think that the West has a lot to blame for not taking stronger action, clearly signing Nord Stream 2 and expanding gas dependency mm -hmm. and enriching Russia in the years that followed instead of imposing more stringent sanctions like some of the SWIFT sanctions that have been imposed now was a major strategic and uh, moral mistake in this context. And the fact that there was not any kind of clarity or any kind of verdict on this MH17 case until now and there hasn't been enough pressure on it has led to Russia using some of the same narratives and falsehoods to justify his war crimes in Ukraine today. Right. In Bucha, for example, they went from a Zashisha operation to claiming that the corpses were staged, with the Kravitor's train operation, so many others. So I think there's a lot to blame from the West in this point of view. Marika, the ICC has already launched an investigation into whether war crimes are being committed uh, in Ukraine and have set up a team to gather evidence about this. How does this MH17 case set legal precedent on Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Well, first of all, it makes it really clear uh, that uh, Russia is has been involved, has been lying. The court also yesterday was very clear in the t uh, um, that multiple times Russia has actually fabricated evidence. And um, in addition to the International Criminal Court, we also see cases uh, against Russia as a state uh, at the European Court of Human Rights and the International Court of Justice that also all revolve, revolve about that question uh, of the involvement in Russia. So there's many types of 
um, a responsibility that's important here. And in terms of criminal accountability, it all relies on evidence. And what we see also in the last 10 years or so is a huge revolution in uh, the types of evidence that are being collected. Uh, and this case, as well as some other cases, you see that digital evidence, social media, user, me user generated in, uh, information is being used and it's entering now the courtrooms. And this court yesterday confirmed that indeed, even though sometimes you know it might not be perfect in terms of chain of custody or other types, you can test the reliability sufficiently that it can be used, especially corroborated with other types of evidence, that it can be upheld, and that also for crimes committed in ongoing armed uh, conflict, where it's difficult to, to get to the crime scene by formal investigators, that this type of evidence is admissible and very usable in, in, in proving them. But, but uh, Marike, isn't it difficult, though, with that type of evidence to establish the chain of command in, in cases like this? It could be, but for instance, what's very interesting in um, this uh, uh, case is you saw all sorts of user, gen all sorts of social media, open source uh, research uh, into the factual relations between um, these uh, individuals connected with recorded telephone conversations. And when we think of the Ukraine conflict and the, and the crimes that are being committed and accountability for them in the future, the SBU has shown that also for these individuals, but also telephone conversations with Borodai and Surkov and others, it has a lot of recorded telephone conversations of people uh, already used in this MH17 trial. So I think there's going to be a lot to come for future prosecutions. All right, Thomas, your thoughts about this. How significant is this verdict for other cases being brought against Russia? And are you hopeful, I know as a, as a you know, sort of victim's family member, that the chain of command can be established and perhaps that those at, at the top can be held responsible? Well, this is a, a really a very important first step. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the prosecutor here in the Netherlands will uh, announce early next year uh, new uh, uh, steps against other persons in the chain of command. Uh, I know from what I've seen from uh, Bellingcat uh, that has been very uh, helpful in discovering names, uh, places, uh, uh, multimedia. They have shown uh, the picture of all those people uh, that are responsible higher in the chain. So I do think that this verdict is going to be very helpful to get to these other people that are really responsible. And we'll see uh, 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 other activities, as I said, by our prosecutor early next year. And I'm looking forward to that. All right, Samuel, you, your thoughts. Do you think generals and other leaders, Russian generals and other leaders, could be prosecuted? Could President Putin be prosecuted one day over the war in Ukraine and other crimes committed? And how difficult will it be, you think, in court, whether an international court or a special court that's set up to, to judge these crimes, uh, to establish a chain of command? So uh, immediately after this war started, the ICC established proceedings that would be able to deal with this. Of course, Russia is not a party to the ICC because it withdrew, which creates some uh, procedural complications. And uh, But many European countries, the, the Americans, NATO countries, have been working with Ukraine on collecting biometric evidence, collecting uh, documentary evidence of uh, war, Russian war crimes, so these tribunals can one day be held. Ukraine has also initiated proceedings against lower-level Russian military personnel, and, and so resulting in a slate of convictions for crimes. But obviously... The big problem is that uh, Russia has got a categorical opposition to extraditing its own citizens. Mm. And Vladimir Putin made that very clear, for example, when the Mueller investigation came out. And there was discussions about extraditing GRU officers involved in election interference. Or you have Jenny Prigozhin, who was on the uh, FBI most wanted list, and Putin was absolutely, no, we don't extradite. So unless there's political change inside Russia, I don't think that it's going to be very likely that these uh, perpetrators are going to be brought to justice in uh, person. But certainly a chain of command can be established and other figures like Surkov, who were so heavily involved in shaping Ukraine policy at that time, can be prosecuted like Gherkin, Karchenko and the suspects that we've seen uh, yesterday. Thank you so much.
Thank you for a very interesting and insightful discussion. Thomas Shansman, Marika Dahoon and Samuel Romani, thank you to all three of you for joining us today on Inside Story. And thank you for watching. You can watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully Batibo, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. Bye for now.